this conference uh, with uh, the great uh, participation of Professor Descola from Collège de France. Uh, I will be very short and I will let the, the, um, um, Abigail uh, presenting the, the, the conference. I would just uh, like to um, thank you, um, Professor Atantayan and his staff for organizing uh, with us this conference. Um, and also, um, I would like to thank also Abigail and uh, Stefan, who are the, um, uh, our two researchers who uh, suggest to uh, open a new axis of research about society and environments. Uh, uh, we had, a, first of all, a seminar in Toulalongkorn University, uh, and uh, our colleague uh, Takrit was uh, uh, engaged in this project. So it's a long project initiated by Abigail uh, last year in 2016. So we are very happy that we arrived to this uh, uh, great moment to be all together uh, with Professor Descola today. Uh, I would like also to thank you, um, um, the French Embassy. Um, they support the coming of uh, Professor Descola. So uh, the Embassy of France uh, in Bangkok, the Embassy of France in Phnom Penh, and the Embassy of France in Hanoi. They support the coming of uh, students from uh, these two countries. So uh, I would like to, to mention this uh, uh, participation. At the end, um, um, we also work with Olivier Evra from IRD. So uh, thank you also for your, your participation in this event. Um, and uh, so I will just say one word about IRASEC which is an institute of research, French Institute of Research on Southeast Asia, contemporary Southeast Asia. Uh, we are based in Bangkok. Uh, it's um, a center of research. We are, uh, um, it's, it was found uh, 18 years ago. And um, we welcome uh, researchers from France uh, on uh, all the social uh, sciences and humanities. Um, they are coming in all the regions, so we are a regional uh, institution. And uh, our aim is to develop research with uh, uh, Thai colleagues, but also with colleagues from all over the, the area, and to develop cooperation between France and Europe and Southeast Asia. So uh, thank you very much for uh, all the organizers and I will let uh, Abigail uh, continue the, the introduction. So I will uh, introduce the workshop very br briefly. Uh, first, I also want uh, to warmly thank uh, Achan Chayan and uh, RCSD team for the hosting of this workshop in Chiang Mai University. All my colleagues who have participated to its organization, Stéphane Renaisson, of course, Kanchana, uh, Kwan uh, Chewan, Olivier Evra, Claire Tran, and I forgot um, maybe some people, Olivier Evra, yeah. So I uh, also warmly thanks, of course, uh, Achan Philippe Descola, who have accepted uh, my invitation to come in Thailand and all the speakers and discussants who uh, revealed the challenge of being here, knowing that uh, many of you, enfin, some of you, only discovered uh, his work uh, quite recently, since his book has been translated into English uh, in uh, 2013. So the impressive uh, comparative uh, piece of work, masterpiece of work of Philippe Tescola, uh, Beyond Nature and Culture, uh, constitute indeed a real invitation to the whole community of anthropologists and beyond to reconsider the evidence of a universal uh, nature and uh, animism, animism too. So this question has a um, special echo in Southeast Asia, as you know, where the um, relation between human and spirits is very diverse, as well as the capacity to articulate from local backgrounds elements uh, of different uh, cosmologies taken from China, India, Europe, and uh, Islam. So the question 
of the, the status of uh, Southeast Asian ontologies has uh, already been launched by Kai Arem and uh, Guido Sprenger in a very inspiring book uh, named uh, Animism in Southeast Asia. So this two days uh, workshop is um, an invitation to pursue the discussion and focus uh, more uh, specifically on the overlapping between animism and analogism in uh, Hindu Buddhist uh, societies. So I want to say also that the holding of this workshop in Chiang Mai University has a special signification too. Uh, when I started my field work here in 1988, I discovered a community of uh, social anthropologists uh, already engaged in the acknowledgement of a more holistic conception of nature, which is uh, more in phase with the diversity of more in interactions between uh, societies and environments in Southeast Asia. So, among these uh, anthropologists, there is, uh, of course, the leading figure of Achan Chayan, who has engaged for the acknowledgement of um, the local modes of uh, the local system of knowledge, the requalifications of the local systems of knowledge. And uh, that's why I'm we are uh, very glad to be here with you to, to hear all your approaches and to reopen, re-engage the debate on the div diversity of uh, natures with new uh, anthropological uh, insights. So thank you very much uh, for being here. And I give the talk to Achan Chayan. Thank you very much, Abigail, for your kind words, acknowledging all of our effort to <coughs> organize <coughs> this interesting workshop. <coughs> it, is, it is my pleasure to welcome all of you who have come to attend this important seminar co-organized by Eurosec and RCSD. The seminar is particularly important because it is inspired by the intellectual contribution on ontological approach of Professor Philip Descola, leading to the reconceptualization of the relationship between <coughs> cultures and nature. Professor Descola specializes in on Amazonian cultures is a bit uh, <clears throat> unknown to us, as Abigail has mentioned. Of, of course, with some exception, like Abigail and Claire and uh, <clears throat> uh, Olivier, who have shortly brief, you give me a brief of uh, Professor Descola's uh, uh, classification of uh, the, the ontology of own culture and, and, and nature. I am <clears throat> confident that uh, we will have a great deal, we will learn a great deal from Professor Descola, ideas, his way of understanding ontology and how he goes beyond cultures and nature as his important book suggests. Regretfully, we will he will be with us only a few days. Uh, he will leave on 19, right? Yeah. Oh. I wish to thank Claire, uh, Abigail, Stefan, and Olivia from ERA, the, th the first three from ERSEC and Olivia from I IRD for their uh, support and their initiative in proposing to RCSD and our colleagues to organize this seminar. I think I hope that uh, this particular seminar, which uh, has a, a little bit different nature f 
from the past uh, seminars and, all, and conference that we have organized <clears throat> because it put emphasis upon on ontolo ontological approach or ontological turn by Professor Descola. So I hope that uh, we <clears throat> will uh, benefit a lot from the exchange among those who are interested in finding out what are beyond cultures and, and natures during the next two days of this seminar. <clears throat> I was asked to give an introduction on culture and nature in South Asia, but this task is rather beyond my ability. Uh, but I, I, <clears throat> I will only focus upon the relationship between culture and nature in Thai society or Thai Lao society. Uh, I, I think I would like to uh, use the example of the river, the, the <coughs> Mekong River, as uh, <coughs> a background for us to understand the relationship between culture and nature. Uh, I think Mekong is one of the largest river, but of course it cannot be compared to the Amazon River, where Professor Descola have, have studied. Have studied, but I think it offers some something for us to think about it. I will talk about the <clears throat> relationship between the fishermen in the Mekong and the, and 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 the river and also talk about the <clears throat> non-human being. In this case, I refer to Payanat, or the Naga, in, in, in the Mekong. <clears throat> uh, The relationship between culture and nature can be seen from the experience of the fishermen in the Moon River, which is a tributary of the Mekong, which has been dammed since 1997 for the sake of development. Before the hydropower dam was built, Livelihood of the people who live along this river depends on fish and some vegetation along the river. So flows of the river brought <coughs> uh, fish to the upstream. The <coughs> smell of the river bring fish. And the color of the river also tell the fishermen that now is a new wave of fish will come, so they are ready to prepare to catch them. The fishermen said that the river water brought smell and taste of minerals to the fish which swam upstream for spawning. The flow of the river brought fish to the village to catch. The noise from the river informed them that fish was swimming upstream. The fishermen then developed who has developed knowledge to make fish traps to catch fish for different species at different locations. They knew the nature of fish and the riverine ecological system. They know that there are hundreds of, to, around 128 species of the macro fish, both migratory and the, the one which uh, come from that particular Moon River, so they know where to catch them because they know they understand well the morphology of the river system. They have classified classify the uh, <coughs> river system into different types, 
regarding uh, particularly the place where fish will spawn or will stop to find some food for them to eat. So when the <coughs> fishermen uh, caught, uh, catch fish or caught fish before, so they not only eat this fish for the, as a food, but also uh, exchange their fish with rice or salt because the fishmen cannot or could not grow rice in their, in their, own, in their own area. They have to depend upon rice from the other villagers. They use the salt in order to make ferment fish and sell it to the market or exchange with other people. They also <clears throat> gave the fish as a gift to their relatives and friends from other villages. More than that, they make food from the fish to give to monks in order to make merit. So the flows of the, the river, <clears throat> which bring fish, also turn the wheels of the local economy, brought life and livelihood of the communities alive. You know. But when the uh, hydropower dam <clears throat> was built, the, this stopped the flows of the river. Fish could not migrate upstream. So the village's livelihood has been almost destroyed. What we witnessed is the dead river and dead life of the people of the Moon River. So in, in this case, I want to show that uh, we, are we are looking at both culture and nature as interactive entities, not as an opposing, uh, uh, opposing entity. Mm -hmm. It's a river which brings food to the villagers, help them to be able to rely upon help them bring food for, for them to rely upon. And they also they have developed their knowledge to catch different types of fish and also being able to sustain their livelihood, as well as expand their social network and also make merit for their next life. In fact, I have uh, prepared uh, my <coughs> Note with regard to the what I would call the the pation of spirit in Thai cosmology, but I am afraid that uh, it will be too lengthy for the purpose of this morning introductory remark. So I will skip that part, but I will go to the next se session on again on the Mac <coughs> on the on the uh, 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 Mekong River. <clears throat> I would like to discuss about the Naga cult. Naga is a <clears throat> giant uh, dragon-like serpent that live or be believed to live under the water or deep in the earth. It is commonly, this mythical creature is commonly found in the imagination of the people of South Asia, particularly in Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia, and perhaps in Sipsong Panna. You can see from, <clears throat> from this uh, uh, <clears throat> Slide. It's the uh, picture of the Naga being being created to uh, tell what the people in the Mekong believe that they, there is this kind of creature in the river. It is widely worshipped by the people of the region, particularly among those who live near the Mekong River. It is a mythical creature believed to live under, under the, world, the underworld or the water world. 
there are two concepts of uh, nagas. The, the one is the naga as a creator of the river and the protector of social world. This is commonly shared among the people who live in the Mekong region or Mekong River Basin. But the second one, naga is a, a concept which has been developed uh, in the Hindu Buddhist cosmology. So there are two different kinds of, of uh, nagas, different origin, different story, different narratives about them. However, the two concepts are intertwined in the practice of Theravada, Theravada Buddhism in Thailand, Laos, and Cambodia. Uh, according to the uh, Prince uh, Sinhanawat, uh, Anaga gave advice to Thai Yuan people or Northern Thai people where to build their first kingdom in Lana or Northern proper. Uh, in the legend of uh, Luang Prabang, uh, Anaga names uh, Si Satana Kanat is the one created the Mekong River. Uh, uh, and is, he is also the one who built Luang Prabang, the <coughs> old uh, kingdom of uh, Laos, or Si Satana kingdom. In the old sketch map, I don't think we have it here. Here. In the old sketch map of Luang Prabang, two, one naga was drawn uh, uh, on the map, and <clears throat> people believe that uh, uh, this naga, his name is Si Satana, Kana, si Satana uh, is the guardian spirit of Luang Prabang, and under his Shifton, there were seven Naga holes or Naga cave in the Mekong River which run through uh, uh, Luang Prabang. Thai and Lao people believe that Naga lives in the underworld and perhaps somewhere, somewhere deep in the, underneath the Mekong. They, they see holes and cave in the hills and near the river banks as the pathway of this naga, which travel back and forth to their underworld. Uh, <clears throat> I would like to acknowledge Andrew Jackson, uh, who, who uh, categorized the naga as river beings, like earth beings, which has been conceptualized by the La Kadena. However, Nagas can be found not only in the river, but also in lake, wetland area, cave, or where there is water. For Southeast Asian people, Naga or Payana is considered to be Lord Protector of nature and social world. Naga has power to enable rains to fall or not to fall. It can tra transform itself into raining clouds. And in general, the Southeast Asian people uh, think that Naga means water. It is a source of all rivers, a source of life energy. It associated with fertility. In Southeast Asia, rice cultivation also depends upon rainfall. Good rain means good condition for rice cultivation. The appearance of Naga in the prediction by astrologists is taken as indicator of rainfall each year. At the traditional New Year, astrologists will predict how many Nagas will how many Nagas will show up in this year? And the number of Naga correspond to the amount of rainfall. One Naga 
means plenty of water, but more nagas means the water and the rainfall will become less because the nagas compete each other to give water to the people. <clears throat> At the level of the world view, world view, nagas can be interpreted in a different ways associated with water and river. It, can be, it is conceptualized as a medium connecting between human world and heaven, as in the case that we can see from the design of the royal chariot carrying, carrying the royal urn of the late king Rama the Ninth uh, <clears throat> from the palace to the royal pyre, symbolizing which symbolized Mount Meru, the apex of heaven. So the Naga can be conceived as a bridge or something which can a conduit to transmit something, to bring something to the heaven or connecting. Uh, uh, the, 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 the earth to the underworld. However, at the local ontological level, Nagas have different realities uh, for these people because their life is associated with river, particularly in the Mekong River. For the local, for the Mekong people, people who live in the Mekong, River b brings uh, river beings, which includes nagas, giant catfish, or plabuk, different fish species as well as vegetable, uh, water and water weeds, have disappeared after them were built in the Upper Mekong, particularly in China. One of the major problems it is the irregularity irregular surges of water level, which cause the collapse of river banks and disappearance of sand beach, sand beach. Water in the Mekong becomes murky during January or April, in leading to the change of the ecological condition for water weeds to grow. These water weeds known as gai for the Long Prabang people, or for the people from in Northern Thailand, they depends upon collecting this water weed for their consumption and for selling for some cash. Uh, if Nagas of the Mekong uh, means fertility and water, then the disappearance of the Nagas means the ruination of the livelihood of the local people. On the other hand, what has happened in the last few years <clears throat> is the proliferation of Naga cults in the northeastern province of Thailand, in, as well as in the eastern border of Thailand, near Cambodia. Uh, some of you may have heard about a very famous uh, Nagas or Payanak in the northeast in Udon Thani. His name is Chao Pu Sisutto, who has recently become uh, famous and he is also known to be the chief of the Naga, which rules the area called Kamchanot. The Kamchanot is a kind of pond, wetland area in Udon Thani. This particular <coughs> uh, <coughs> area or Kamchanot has become a, a new tourist attraction. Many movie stars, singers, urban middle class, and other people, of people of different walks of life, go there to Kamchanot to seek for Bu Lung Bu Sisuto's blessings and ask for good luck and fortune. <clears throat> Kamshino Shrine, where Chopu resides, becomes famous tourist attraction and further popularized by a television series called Naki. And 
Now, there are projects to build Kham Chanot number one, number two, number three in Bangkok, or more or less like a Disneyland spot like that. <clears throat> in, the other, in the other provinces along the Mekong, Naga statues as well as narrative of different Japu are constructed to promote tur tourist business as the economy on the other side of the river, meaning in Laos, is become more prosperous. So the Naga cult has been has been turned into a kind of a, a business-like activities to attract more people to come in order to boost the local economy. <clears throat> At the eastern border near Cambodia, <clears throat> where there are many caves in limestone mountains, <clears throat> Chapu Ananta Nakara is another Naga chief of different lineage, uh, different from Chapu Sisuto, is believed to inhibit, inhibit in the caves, in one of the caves under this mountain. Unlike Chapu Sisuto, who has several competing mediums, Ananda Nakarat inhibits in the cave, in a cave which is also used by, used as a Buddhist temple. The place, according to Luang Pu Wang, who is an abbot, is associated with, according to Luang Pu Wang, a Buddhist monk, this place is associated, associated with King Dak Sin of Thonburi, who visited the place during his campaign to consolidate Siam after the fall of Ayutthaya. Kapu Ananda Nakarat is conceived of being a protector of the eastern region and also the protectors of the, mo of the monarchy. I have uh, talks about <clears throat> culture and nature based upon the, the river system. Not only the, the fishermen and the fish, but also another river beings that is Payana, uh, the, the, the giant serpent, which uh, is still well regarded by the local people. I hope that this introductory mark ha can give you some ideas about the relationship between culture and nature in South Asia and how it is conceptualized. They are not seen as a separate opposing entities but culture and nature interact with each other, inform each other, intertwine, and co-create a lived world for human and non-human beings. In the Southeast Asian context, flows of river brings fish to people, while people use fish to sustain their livelihood and social relations. Intervention of river flow can physically disrupt the flow of life of human and river beings. That river can bring dead life, as in the case of Moon River, where dam was built. In the case of the Mekong River, disappearance of river beings, which include nagas, giant catfish, water weeds, occur after dams were built in the upper part of the river. In Southeast Asian countries like Thailand, Laos, Cambodia, if there is an, anto there is an anthological category of spirit exists in between people and nature. Spirits, are, spirit which are non-human beings, are hierarchically different and possess differential power, which can bring fertility, good fortune, or disaster, as well as bad luck. The spirit of salt mine, for example, uh, which I did, cannot have time to talk about this, 
uh, is also can be seen if, if it is if it is categorized as animism, according to Professor Descola, I think it also has a political meaning when this spirit is, has been invoked in order to protect common property of salt miners. The river beings like Naga belong to local ontology signifying the river and water. When the flows of river is disrupted, the Naga disappear like giant catfish. For local people, the river inform the river in the river informs them about something happening. But the concept of Naga is also now being seized upon by business community in order to use it as an icon for tourism promotion, a way to, as well as a way to construct marketable identity. So the relationship between culture and nature, uh, if we would like to go beyond this, I think we need also to, need to, the, the, the relationship needs to be understood not only from the interaction between the two of them, but, to, but from a political perspective as well. Thank you very much for listening to me. I am delighted to be able to participate to this seminar and I would like to say a few words of thanks first for um, the uh, people, institutions who made that possible. Uh, the RASEC and its director, Claire Tran, uh, the intellectual driving force also behind the theme of the seminar, Abigail Pesses and Stéphane uh, Renaisson, and of course, uh, Professor uh, Chayan uh, Padanaputi, who uh, hosts us in this uh, institution. So many thanks again for uh, this opportunity uh, I am given here to um, address a question that has been interesting me for a number of years and on which I would say a few words now as a sort of introduction to the workshop. So my long, uh, long interest um, uh, as an anthropologist, that is, uh, of uh, understanding the different ways according to which uh, life processes can be conceptualized, uh, was uh, triggered many years ago when I was studying what I called at the time, uh, with an, uh, what I feel now is an improper expression, the socialization of nature, uh, by uh, members of a recently contacted uh, a Meridian tribe in the upper Amazon. And um, I discovered uh, during this immersion of three years among the um, Achua people with my wife and fellow anthropologist and Christine Taylor, that what I believed initially to be a universal feature of the perception of the world, the tendency to classify beings uh, and phenomena, whether as social kind or as natural kind, was in fact totally irrelevant uh, for the people with whom I was living. For them, animals, most plants, not all plants, but most plants, and even certain artifacts, were endowed with a soul which converted these entities into persons with a full-fledged social and cultural life persons with whom communication in dreams and uh, through uh, magical songs was reputedly possible. As a consequence, the distinction that we in the West usually make between nature and society was for them quite meaningless. For the past 40 years, I've been trying to explore the consequence of this what was for me shattering discovery. Historically, by trying 
to show that the great divide between nature and culture is not a cognitive universal, but a recent and contingent um, tool crafted in the West in the course of the past uh, two centuries. Ethnographically, by um, uh, examining the, uh, the great variety of ways according to which humans establish continuities or detect continuities and discontinuities between humans and non-humans. And anthropologically, by trying to find a more encompassing and less cultural specific theoretical framework which would accommodate this variety um, within a single ana analytical model. By contrast with some colleagues um, in the social sciences who are also critical um, of the dualism of nature and society, I strongly believe that trying to eliminate the duality uh, between the subject and the world in the description and analysis of social life must not lead to discarding the quest for framing devices that would account for the coherence and the regularity of the behavior of the members of a community, of the distinctive style of their actions, and of the codified expressions that they give to these. In other words, it is not enough to show that the opposition between uh, the universality of natural laws and the randomness of cultural diversity is meaningless for many societies. It is also necessary to integrate this distinction between nature and culture in a new uh, analytical framework where far from constituting the template that would allow anthropologists to gouge distant cultures, it would be nothing more than one of the possible expressions of a more general schema structuring the objectification of things in the world. I have presented at length such a general theory of the forms of experience in a book, Beyond Nature and Culture, published, as Abigail mentioned this morning, uh, in English in 2013. What I intend to do in this paper is to sum up the general argument of the book and examine the relevance of my propositions when applied to Southeast Asian ethnographic material. Simply uh, put, my, um, I, I would like first to say a few words about the very nature, in fact, of my endeavor. My, my purpose, in fact, is to bring to light structural regularities in the ways the phenomenological world is instituted and to show their compatibilities and incompatibilities. However, any analysis that purports to reveal structural regularities comes with a cost. And that cost is usually the lack of plausible connection between, on the one hand, the, the models built by an observer in order to describe the properties of the social system he or she studies, and on the other hand, the cognitive and practical mediations, thanks to which the structural patterns thus isolated um, by the analyst could eventually come to regulate or orient the behavior of the individuals of the society under analysis. This is a criticism that has been often addressed to structural anthropology, and quite rightly so. Now, recent research in cognitive psychology on the theory of schemas may provide a mean to account for uh, the way in which models of relations and behavior could structure actual practice 
without being consciously apprehended, that is, without appearing to individuals as repertories of propositional norms. Schemas are abstract structures, such as the artificial perspective, or the monofocal perspective, if you wish, or the routine scenario of daily interactions, which organize skills, perceptions, and actions without mobilizing a declarative knowledge. They are mental, sensory motor, and emotional dispositions that are embodied thanks to the experience acquired in a specific social milieu. They are, to borrow Maurice Bloch's uh, words, things that go without saying. Some of, th some of them, some of these schemas, which I call integrative schemas, are, I think, particularly interesting for anthropologists. For they could provide us um, with the type of mediating function which gives us the sense of sharing with other individuals the combination of habits that we usually call culture. They can be defined as cognitive structures which generate inferences endowed with a high degree of abstraction that are capable of ensuring the compatibility with, between families of specialized schemas as well as generating new ones by induction. And structural analysis, as I see it, gives access to an understanding of how people schematize their experience of, and of how this process um, provides them with the explicit systems of codification to which they adhere. And the guarantee that the formal model constructed by the analyst does reveal some features of the social system that he or she studies would therefore accrue from the fact that these features are not derived from some universal properties of the mind, except perhaps in the, at a very general level, but rather are expressions of the frame devices through which the actors themselves tacitly objectify their relations to the world. However, this objectification is not done at random. In order to understand how it is done, my point of departure is a very uh, simple uh, thought experiment based on a very simple intuition that I initially borrowed from Edmund Husserl, uh, the idea that we, humans, are equipped to deal with the world with two basic assets, which is a body and an intentionality. And this equipment allows us to generate a specific kind of integrative schema, which I call an identification. That is, the elementary mechanism by the means of which I recognize differences and similarities between I and the objects of, in the world by inferring analogies um, um, and distinctions of appearance, of behavior, of attribute between what I think I am and what I think that the others are. In other words, I can attribute or deny to an as yet indeterminate alter an interiority and a physicality analogous to the ones I believe I am endowed with. Interiority is taken here in a deliberately vague sense that, according to the context, uh, will refer to the attributes ordinarily associated to the soul, to uh, the mind, to consciousness, that is, intentionality, subjectivity, reflexivity, the aptitude to dream, to signify, etc., or to more abstract characteristics, such as the idea that I share with an alter, a uh, same essence or origin 
or that we belong to the same ontological category. Physicality, by contrast, refers to form, substance, physiological, perceptual, sensory motor, and proprioceptive uh, processes, or even temperament as an expression of the purported influence of bodily humors. And the identifications based on the combination of interiority and physicality are in fact very limited. When confronted with an alter, whether human or non-human, I can either surmise that this object, that is the object of this intentional perception and, 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 and uh, idea, possesses elements of materiality and interiority that are analogous to mine, and this I call totemism. Or that his interiority and his physicality are entirely distinct from mine, and this I call analogism. Or that we have similar interiorities and different materialities or physicalities, and this I call animism. Or that our interiorities are discontinuous, and our physicality is continuous, and this I call naturalism. And this formula define four major types of ontologies, that is of systems of detection of qualities among existing things, which in turn provide encoring points for sociocosmic forms of aggregation, conceptions of alterity, definition of the epistemic subjects, form of figuration, etc., etc. Let's examine now briefly some properties of these four modes of identification. Animism as a continuity of souls and a discontinuity of bodies is quite common in South and Northern North America, in Siberia, in some parts of Southeast Asia, I'll go back to that later, where people endow plants, animals, and other elements of their environment with a subjective self and establish with these entities all sorts of personal relations. In animist systems, humans and non-humans are conceived as possessing the same type of interiority. Most animals, some plants, are treated as persons endowed with a soul which allow them to uh, communicate with humans. And it is because of this common internal uh, essence uh, that non-humans are said to possess social characteristics, that is behavior uh, based on the respect of kinship rules, for instance, or uh, ethical codes, or ritual activity, etc., etc. However, the reference shared by most beings in the world is mankind as a general condition and not man as a species, not homo sapiens as a species. In other words, humans and all the kinds of non-humans with whom humans interact have each different physicalities in that their identical internal essences are lodged in different types of bodies that are often described locally as clothing. In fact, it's more than described, it's the same word, body and clothing. That can be donned or discarded, the better to underline the autonomy of the bodies from the interiorities which inhabited them. Now, these specific clothings induce contrasted perspectives on the world, in that the physiological and perceptual constraints proper to a type of body impose to each class of being a specific position and a specific point of view in the general ecology of relations. So human and non-human persons have an integrally culturally, cultural view, if you wish, of their life sphere because they share the same kind of interiority, 
but the world that all these entities apprehend and use is different because their bo bodily equipment are distinct. These differences of bodies uh, beyond form rather than substance. This is hardly surprising as animist ontologies borrow part of their operational schema from the model of the trophic chain. Everywhere in the animist archipelago, one finds the idea that vitality, energy, fecundity constantly circulate between organisms thanks to the process of capture, exchange, and consuming of flesh. And so this constant recycling of tissues and fluids at all levels, which is analogous to the one which characterizes nutritional interdependence, is a clear indication that all these beings that ingest one another cannot be distinguished by the substances they are made of. By contrast, the place that each species occupy in the trophic chain is precisely determined by its organic e equipment, since it's, it's this organic equipment conditions both the milieu accessible to the species and through the organs of locomotion uh, and of acquisition of food, the type of resources that can be tapped in this specific milieu. So the form of bodies is thus the entire biological tool that allows a species to occupy a habitat and to lead in this habitat the distinctive lifestyle through which it is identified. So although many species share in animism uh, uh, a certain interiority, each one of them thus possesses its own physicality under the guise of a specific ethogram which will determine its own umwelt in the sense of Jacob von Uxkul, that is, the salient features of its environment are those that are geared to its specific bodily tools, mode of locomotions, of reproduction, of acquiring food, etc. The life of a bird and the world of a bird is not the world of a fish, it's not the world of a naga, it's not the world of a human, etc., etc. So it entirely depended on physicality. Let us now turn to the second mode of identification, where some beings in the world share sets of physical and moral attributes that seem to cut across the boundaries of species. I call that totemism. It's an old habit in anthropology of using concepts uh, that were forged at the end of the 19th century, but giving new meanings to this concept. And this is inherited from philosophy. We are speaking of soul, substance, uh, attribute, and concepts like that since uh, the Greeks. But uh, every new generation of philosophers for 2,500 years have given new meanings to these concepts. It's the same in anthropology. So I'm using this concept of totemism, but in a rather different sense from the one it's been used until now. Um, the, 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 the main sense attached to totemism was the one lately that was given to it by Claude Lévi-Strauss in his uh, famous book, Le Totemisme Aujourd'hui, when he attempted to debunk what he called the totemic illusion by showing that totemism uh, can be viewed as a general classificatory device using natural discontinuities as a mental model to organize social segmentation. This was the accepted meaning, which I used myself previously in a couple of papers where I tried, mistakenly as it is, um, to contrast animism and totemism by stating that while 
totemism uses natural discontinuities between natural species in order to map social relations um, between humans and non-humans. Um, um, animism, or between humans, excuse me, animism uh, uses social categories in order to map relations between humans and natural objects. However, I realized that this was a too neat inversion um, of um, the, um, uh, which in fact ratified uh, the distinction between nature and society, which is inherent to the Levistorsian version of totemism, and thus such an inversion did not render justice to animism where this distinction between nature and, and culture is meaningless. I now believe that this distinction is also meaningless in the case of totemism, not only of animism. For totemism is more than a general classific classificatory device, it is also and perhaps foremost a very original ontology which is best exemplified by Aboriginal Australia. There the main totem of a group of humans, most often an animal or a plant, but, but more, about 70% of the, of the totems, of the so-called totems, are animals. And all the beings, human and non-human, that are affiliated to it are said to share certain general attributes of physical conformation, substance and behavior by virtue of a common origin localized in space. Now, as the linguist Karl Georg von Brandenstein has shown very clearly in his thorough analysis of the meaning of uh, Australian totem terms, these attributes that cross-cut the species boundaries are not derived from what is improperly called the eponym entity, since the word designating the totem is in many cases not the word of a species, that is, it's not a biological taxon, but rather the name of an abstract property which is present in this species, as well as in all the beings subsumed under it in a totemic grouping. In other words, the nature, well, the names, let's say, of the totemic classes are terms that denote properties which are also used to designate the totemic species and not the reverse. That is, they are not names of zoological taxa from which would be inferred the typical attributes of the totemic classes. It is thus difficult to maintain, at least for Australia, but there, uh, there are other cases elsewhere, of course, the classificatory interpretation of totemism, since the basic difference here is between aggregates of attributes that are common to human, to humans and to non-human non-humans within classes designated by abstract terms and not between animal and vegetal species that would provide, so to speak, naturally by their manifest discontinuities of form and <coughs> behavior, a sort of analogical template that could be used so as to structure social discontinuities. The third mode of identification, which I call analogism for reasons that will be clear a little bit later, is predicated on the idea that all the entities in the world are fragmented into a multiplicity of essences, of forms and substances. I'm using the classical neo-Aristotelian vocabulary because I have no other <laughs> one at my disposal. Um, separated by uh, minute intervals, 
often ordered along a graded scale, such as in the grid chain of being, which served as the main cosmological model during the uh, European Middle Ages and the Renaissance. And this disposition allows for a recombination of the systems of initial contrasts into a dense network of analogies linking the intrinsic properties of each autonomous entity present in the world. So what is most striking in these such systems is the amount of ingenuousness um, with which all the similarities and the resonances liable to provide a basis for inferences are actively sought for, especially as these are applied in crucial domains of life, such as the prediction and treatment of illnesses and misfortune. So the obsession with analogies becomes a dominating feature. Analogies, analogical reasoning on analogical thinking is universal, but here it takes a particular form, um, as for instance in traditional China, where according to um, the, um, the French sinologist uh, Marcel Granet, I quote him, society, man, the world are objects of a global knowledge constituted by the sole use of analogy. However, analogy is uh, only a result or a consequence of the necessity to organize the world composed of a multiplicity of, of independent elements, such as in the Chinese Wangwu, the uh, 10,000 essences, elements, whatever the trans translation you choose. And analogy becomes possible and thinkable only if the terms that it conjoins are initially distinguished. If the power to detect similarities between things is applied to singularities that are by this process partially extracted from their original isolation. So analogism can be seen as a sort of hermeneutic dream um, of completeness and totalization which proceeds from a sort of dissatisfaction um, admitting that all the components of the world are separated by tiny discontinuities, it entertains the hope of weaving these weakly differential elements in a canvas of affinities and attractions which has all the appearances of continuity, but continuity can never be achieved. The ordinary state of the world is indeed a multiplicity of reverberating differences and resemblance is only the expected means to render this fragmented word intelligible and tolerable. So this multiplication of the elementary pieces of the world are reverberating within each of its parts, including humans of course, uh, divided into a great, great number of components, themselves divided uh, in successive nesting, partially uh, located outside of their bodies, appears to be a distinctive feature of analogous ontologies and the best clue for identifying them. Apart from the case of China, to which I've already alluded, this type of ontology was dominant in Europe from antiquity to the Renaissance and is also quite common in some parts of Asia, in West Africa, in the native cultures of Mexico and the Andes, etc. The last mode of identification, which I call naturalism, corresponds to an ontology which emerged in the West in propositional form in the course of the 17th century. My hypothesis is that it emerged in figurative form much earlier, but I won't enter into this. 
and which would best be de described as a process, let's say, the process of naturalization. A process which has been going on via the second colonial expansion and the globalization process in many other parts of the world. For naturalism is not only the idea that nature exists, that certain entities owe their existence and development to a principle which is extraneous both to chance and to the effect of human will. Naturalism also implies a counterpart, a world of artifice and free will, the complexity of which has progressively emerged um, under the scrutiny of analysts until it rendered necessary in the course of the 19th century the institution of special sciences which were given the task of stabilizing its boundaries and characteristics, the social sciences. And the, the, the diversity of expression of the creativity of humans as producers of science, of norms, of goods, that is, semiotic economy, etc., etc. All this was of rendered possible when the idea that foregrounded by nature, there were collectives that did things socially at the same time. This is, as Foucault has shown very well, inexistent uh, until the mid 18th century. Now, if one considers naturalism, that is the coexistence between a single unifying nature and a multiplicity of cultures, not as the all-embracing template which allows objectifying any reality, but as one among several other modes of identification, then its contrastive properties appear much more clearly. For, for instance, naturalism inverts the ontological, uh, the ontological premises of animism since instead of claiming an identity of souls and a difference of bodies, it is um, predicated upon a discontinuity of interiorities and a material continuity. Only humans have a mind, a capacity to signify a cogito in the Cartesian sense, etc., etc. What distinguishes humans from non-humans in the naturalist ontology is the mind, the soul, moral conscience, language, and so forth, in the same way as human groups are distinguished from one another by a collective internal disposition that used to be called Volksgeist in German, but is more familiar to us, or the Genie, Genie, Genie du Peuple in French, but which, which is more uh, familiar to us now by, uh, under its modern label of culture. Very recent term, again. On the other hand, we have been um, informed, especially since Darwin, that the physical dimension of humans locates them within a material continuum wherein they do not stand out as singularities. So the ontological discrimination, discrimination which excludes non-human organisms biologically very close to us, thinking of course as species like the chimpanzees, is a sign of the privilege granted in the naturalist mode of identification to criteria based on the expression of a purported interiority, language, self-consciousness, theory of mind, etc., rather than those based on material continuity. I want to make clear, very clear, that these four modes of identification are in no way exclusive. My hypothesis is that each human activates one 
or another of them in certain circumstances. But that one of them is always dominant in a specific time and place in that it gives to members of a community who have been socialized according to the same patterns, the main framework through which they perceive and interpret salient aspects of their environment. So, although ontology is encountered in some parts of the world, evidence one or another mode of identification in a very pure form, let's say, Amazonia for animism, Australia for totemism, or China for analogism, perhaps the most common situation is one of hybridity, Hybrid, hybridity in the sense of a combination of sets of specific features pertaining to different modes of identification. So this typology of models should thus uh, be taken as a heuristic device rather than as a method for classifi classifying societies into rigid compartments. However, hybridity does not mean here, as it often does nowadays, a random mixture of elements resulting from historical vagaries. For most societies in that sense would be hybrids or are hybrids resulting from a merger of inner processes and external influences. Hybridity here means a state of equilibrium in a logical process of structural transformation from one of the four modes of identification to another, where some elements of the core ontology are still present and cohabit with elements of another core ontology without the latter predominating over the former. In uh, the book, uh, my, this book, Beyond Nature and Culture, I attempted to uh, show how such a structural transformation would work by examining the ontological transformations required to pass from an egalitarian relationship between humans and non-humans to a hierarchical one as one moves in space westward from the hunting societies of northern North America to the nomadic herders of southern Mongolia through, the, through a series of intermediate steps. And to explain these structural dynamics, I have to return briefly to another proposition that I made in Beyond Nature and Culture to account for um, the, the social and cultural diversification within each of the modes of identification. The four ontological archipelagos, let's say, are not uniform. They become internally differentiated by various elementary patterns of relation that shape um, interactions between humans and between humans and non-humans alike. These relations can be divided into two main groups. On the one hand, exchange, predation, and gift, or sharing if you wish, wherein a value moves between potentially reversible terms that have an equivalent ontological status. On the other hand, production, protection, and transmission, wherein the relation is oriented between hierarchical terms. And although these sets of relations can be said to form the basic toolkit of the social sciences, I have reworked them slightly. For instance, 
by contrast with the position of Marcel Mauss, gift is here differentiated from exchange as exchange um, always calls for a double movement of give and take while gift excludes by principle a counterpart otherwise it would not be a gift similarly production is in no way the universal process it passes for in uh, Marxist and constructivist, social constructivist approaches for the idea of an intentional agent imposing a form on matter according to a sort of mental blueprint is a conception of action that is uncommon in many non-European cultures. So these patterns of relations are partly based on cognitive processes but are not inbuilt categories or categorical imp imperatives. Rather, they should be treated as objectified properties of collective life, which come to be embodied in physical and mental disposition and are thus stabilized as habitus. So giving, including giving oneself to others, taking or receiving from them, exchanging with them, but also appropriating others, protecting them, producing them, or placing oneself in their dependence, form the basic set of interpersonal actions that humans have inherited from their phylogeny. It should come as no surprise that they provide a repertory from which each collective will draw a favorite mode of relation to others. So my argument is that the main condition for change, that is for the transformation of specific combinations of ontological types and patterns of relation, resides in the substitution of a dominant scheme of relation by another. For if the same ontology can be modulated by very dissimilar relational configurations, this tolerance, let's say, does not extend beyond a certain point, that is, certain patterns of relation that play a minor part in a given ontological context may see their role increase for a variety of reasons in such a way that they end up becoming incompatible, incompatible with the dominant ontological distribution. As a result, the dominant ontological distribution may evolve towards a new ontological scheme that will provide uh, or that will prove, let's say, more hospitable to the new hegemonic relation. As I said a moment ago, I have attempted to illustrate uh, such a process in Beyond Nature and Culture by showing how a relation of protection evolves as it passes from a very, very marginal position within the, con the context of what I call giving animism, which is typical of uh, native northern North America, that is, this relation of protection being the protection granted to his herd by the spirit masters of the caribou, who is seen as a herder, a herder, a herder. Um, and as it passes, then this relation of, of uh, this very marginal relation of protection, as it passes to a dominant position um, in the context of what I call protective analogism, typical of the herders of southern si Siberia. That is, the protection afforded by humans to their cattle, by the divinities to humans and to their animals, and um, by the ancestors to their descendants, etc., etc., etc. Through a series of intermediate positions in eastern and northern 
Siberia, where you have a combination between hunting uh, reindeers and domesticating reindeers. Where, so you have a combination of different types of relation of protection on the one hand and predation on the other, which are characteristic on the one hand of analogism and on the other end of animism. Although animal domestication seems to play a central role in this transition process, the actualization of the technique is in no way automatic. Domestic domestication was post potentially present in native northern North America through this pattern of relationship implied between the master, the spirit master of animals and the herds of caribou, but was never actualized. And it was even actively resistant. There are cases, very interesting cases of active resistance to domestication because its end result a new status for certain animals did not fit the local ontology. It seems to me that a similar line of analysis could be applied to Southeast Asian ethnographic material. In a recent book that was mentioned by Abigail this morning, uh, Animism in Southeast Asia, uh, which is partly devoted to discussing the applicability of my propositions to the region. The editors, Kai Orem and uh, Guido Sprenger, um, argue that the cultural, this Southeast Asia, this cultural area, challenges my typology, notably because the, the, the majority of indigenous cosmologies in Southeast Asia share some features with both animism and analogism as I define them, while differing from both in other respects. And uh, this is an argument that is well put by, um, in his introduction to the volume by um, Orem, who argues in particular uh, that the institution uh, the institutions in Southeast Asia have a distinctive analogous flavor, that is, that as I characterize them, the ancestor worship, uh, sacrifice, uh, spirit possessions, uh, formal priesthood, etc. While the basic features of an analogous ontology, such as a highly segmented and diversified world, a fragmented and unstable subject, are generally, generally lacking. We could discuss that at length, but I won't have the time to do it now. Except for one, except for one, which is in my view the most important defining feature of analogism, which is hierarchy. An analogist ontology, properly speaking, would also be in common, according to Odem, uh, corresponding to pre-modern state formations, such as the Shan principalities, of the Javanese kingdom, for instance. If I understand Orem correctly then, what he proposes for Southeast Asia is a graded ontological continuum from egalitarian animism to straightforward analogism with a sort of central core of um, hierarchical animism, which he calls the cosmological prototype. And the pole of egalitarian animism would be well represented by the Shewong of Malaysia, which indeed play a major part in my own definition of animism, to which should be added also other Orongasli groups, such as the, the, the Ma Betisek, the Batek, etc. While the most hierarchical forms of animism such as the Toraja or the Bugis uh, polities in Sulawesi uh, would verge on analogism. I have nothing against this graded model which in fact resembles structurally at least the North, Northwestern America to Southern Mongolia group of transformation which I put forth in Beyond Nature and Culture, with the difference 
that regarding Southeast Asia, the continuum is not made up of a contiguous series of transformation extending of a space, but rather of an encapsulation of different ontological regimes often coexisting in the same geographical space and even in some cases uh, corresponding to a regular oscillation of the same polity between the egalitarian and the hierarchical mode or the hierarchical poles of animism, if you wish, as with the notorious uh, Gumsa, Gumlao uh, contrast among the Kachin. Thus, the problem is not thus, is not, uh, is not so much to account for how one moves from the most hierarchical forms of animism to straightforward analogism, but rather the question is to account for how one moves from egalitarian to hierarchical animism and to understand whether these two forms of animism represent variations within a single ontological complex or are already symptoms of an ontological shift. Let's examine the second part of the question, um, if I have some time left, um, so as to better identify the main features of what Orem alternatively calls hierarchical animism or the Hill Tribe cosmology. These are very easy to sum up. The feature common to all form of animism, which is universal interiority or quasi-universal interiority, is graded in the Hill Tribe cosmology, let's say, uh, along a vertical scale, the upper layers of which are peopled by powerful spirits, and often topped by a supreme one, or a supreme one that commands different domains, water, land, etc., forest. Mm. Rather than being segmented along a horizontal plane, as they are, for instance, in South American animism. In standard animism, of which I'm talking later tomorrow, I think, um, in Amazonia, for instance, Beings are integrated by a principle of symmetrical intersubjectivity between ontologically equivalent beings. And they are differentiated along the axis of physicality. They all have the same kind of soul, but lodged in different kinds of bodies. In Southeast Asian animism, beings have also different kinds of bodies, but by contrast with the previous type of animism, they have also graded souls. That is, they are differentiated along a vertical scale. And this is because, as uh, Thomas Kirsch has, I think, very well shown in his book, Feasting and Social Association, Hill Trapp's notions of potency, of fertility, of fecundity, not only can be interpreted um, according to a standard animist regime as taking the form of an individual soul for whatever kind of being, that is as a disposition which is intrinsic to a human or non-human being, albeit differentiated along a graded scale of potency, it can also be seen as a capacity originating from outside the being associated with it, that is acquired from an external source and often taking the form of a personal quality embodied in a spirit. Personal qualities such as cunning, courage, luck, uh, ambition, wealth, etc., etc. Now, both as an aspect of the soul and as a capacity deriving from an external source, interiority tends to be reified as something detachable from a subject, whether human or non-human, a substantive quality that becomes more visible and is thus liable 
to be differentiated along a graded scale of power. The second major feature of Southeast Asian animism, as I see it, namely sacrifice, appears to me as a mere consequence of the former. For reasons that I will state uh, further, it is a very efficient mechanism for articulating the various layers of graded subjectivities. A third feature, the fact that the exchange, the exchange of perspectives in uh, what Eduardo Viveros de Castro calls perspectivism does not occur between humans and animals, as is the case in Amazonia, in northern North America also, and in Siberia, but between humans and species, human and, and, uh, sorry, and humans and spirits, um, is, is a not, it's a noteworthy uh, feature, but it's circumstantial in my opinion, as it is found also in Mongolia, for instance. It's very common in Mongolia. As such, it would provide an interesting aspect to add to an expanded ontological group of transformation ranging from American animism to South Asian, Southeast Asian animisms, where along the way, spirits with specific appearances have progressively replaced spirits in animal forms. A last feature of Southeast Asian animism is that interiority is not only graded according to a theory of what Kirsch calls unequal souls. These can also be reified or outwardly expressed in wealth, in rank, in worldly powers, thus broadcasting a visible way, in a visible way, what are in, in, initially internal dispositions whether innate or acquired. Now it seems to me that all these features have a close connection to animal domestication in the sense that in egalitarian animisms, Amazonia let's say, humans take animals, animal lives uh, through hunting while the spirits of animals take human lives in return as human illness, misfortune, and perhaps even death are ultimately a form of counter-predation exerted by game animals and their master spirits, their keepers. By contrast, in Southeast Asian animism, spirits who attempt to take human lives receive instead the life of domestic animals offered in sacrifice. This is possible because, as I've shown in Beyond Nature and Culture, sacrificial animals share many characteristics of humans and can thus replace them in the confrontation with spirits. What mainly differs between standard animism and Southeast Asian animism is thus the status of animals. In the former case, in standard animism or Amazonian animism, if you wish, the game animal is an alter ego of, um, or two, of, or two, uh, humans. <laughs> uh, but it, the game animal is also the absolute embodiment of alterity out of which humans derive their contrastive identity. This is why animal domestication is inconceivable, inconceivable and unheard of in animist America. But when a relation of uh, 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 protection is extended by humans over animals, as is the case with domestication, the domesticated animals can become substitutes for the former, for humans, in sacrifice. And the exchange of lives against lives, which is characteristic of Amerindian animism, transforms into a mediated exchange where the occupants of the 
middle layer exchange with the occupants of the upper layer who control them, the lives of the occupants of the lower layer whom they control in order to ensure their own welfare. So the cascading relations of protection and dependency implied everywhere by animal domestication are thus the basis for an extension of animism towards a graded continuum of life-giving and life-taking, which, however, does not jeopardize the system of generalized intersubjectivity upon which it is predicated. So the, the passage from hierarchical animism to analogism proper, which, which is another shift, in my opinion, requires not so much a furthering of the hierarchical pattern as an accentuation of the ontological distinction between the various layers of the hierarchy, both in terms of interiority and in terms of physicality. An amplification of the system of unequal souls, which ends up in the analogist hyper-fragmented subject, is, I think, rendered possible by the fact that the typical Southeast Asian personhood, both human and non-human, is multifaceted because different aspects of it are actualized according to what they relate to. Whence derives not only the idea of graded souls, where entities exhibit varying degrees of agency and boundedness, but also the idea that internal differentiation, which stems from the very nature, or will stem from the very nature of the entities with which aspects of the soul will deal with, ending up in the multiplied and unstable self typical of analogist ontologies. As for the differences in physicality, which are already one of the two <coughs> defining features of standard animism and the basis for the existence of the various human and non-human tribe species of which I will talk in a, another paper, they become amplified when different tribe species, that is different collective with the same physicality, different tribe species then um, become integrated within a single collective. And the best solution for such a combination is to grade what I call the tribe species along a hierarchical scale according or analogous to the Hindu caste system as the Toraja and the Bogis have done with their own stratified social organization where each caste is seen as a different natural kind. There are different physicalities within the same collective. Here are some thoughts I wanted to share with you on the question of ontological regimes in Southeast Asia, pleading your indulgence for the gross oversimplification I have probably committed, and in the hope that learning from you all during these two days will enable to clarify my ideas, to redress my mistakes, and perhaps refine my general propositions.